Storytellers don't just talk about the world, they shape it. The stories we share are like soil. They're living, dynamic, and the kinds of stories we choose to tell determines the kind of world that grows around us. On a recent episode of Creative Change Maker, I addressed this big question, how do I make my storytelling more relatable? Especially when the, the people who I am telling stories about and the people who I am sharing their stories with have very little in common. I pointed out that it's very helpful to find universal themes, things that are relatable on both ends to help bridge the gap. And I wanna go a step further with that then and say once you've found those universal themes, how do you work with them? How do you draw them out to make that connection fuse and stick? Now, cross-cultural storytelling is a very large portion of my work. In fact, I began my work as a storyteller because it enabled me to do what I love, which is interfacing with people who live in very different parts of the planet and seeing how we can come together and make that distance feel a little less small. Now, because I've gotten to travel quite a bit and I've had that privilege, I can kind of relate to a wide variety of cultures really well. But I also have to recognize that a lot of people who watch the stuff I make might not be primed for that in the same way. That said, I still believe a connection can be made and that it's really valuable and important to make that connection. There's a big difference between hearing a story from a person from a different culture and leaning in or tuning out. Now, I'm pretty fresh from a storytelling trip I recently took to both uh, Ethiopia and India, two very different contexts, different from each other, different from my regular life. And while we were on the ground filming, we were doing a lot of on the spot strategizing about what some of our finished product videos could look like. We thought about our audience and we thought about the people we had a chance to interview in Ethiopia and we thought like, what would make our audience fall in love with them? And that's what got me asking this question quite a bit. On the flight back, I watched an Indian movie. You know, on those long haul international flights, I love watching the international films just because I feel like the airlines tend to do a pretty good job of curating ones that are uh, solid quality. Shout out to you KLM for being really good at this, even though that's not who I flew back with. Um, I was on Qatar Airways and I watched one called Cello Show. Cello Show. <laughs> So it's a Gurajati film, uh, which is a, a language spoken in various parts of India, and it's set in a small village. There's this boy who goes with his family to see his first movie in a theater, and he absolutely falls in love with the world of film, with the craft. His dad isn't thrilled about this. You know, the only reason why they saw a movie in the first place was because it was a religious film about their, um, their goddess um, Kali, uh, but he thinks that the industry of film as a whole is just pretty shady. So as the story unfolds, it goes in pretty whimsical directions. The boy and all his friends in the village, they essentially make their own theater. They start to scrap together uh, pieces of bike tires and equipment from the actual theater to make their own projector. They start stealing film reels uh, that they can use in their own theater. And you can kind of see how there's already a storyline about bridging cultural gaps within this story. But by the end, it no longer really felt like I was watching a film that was set somewhere so different from where I lived because it felt more familiar than unfamiliar. Forget the fact that I never really hear Gurajati spoken in my regular life. I know what it's like to be a kid with dreams and ambitions that are bigger than your immediate surroundings can cater to. I think a lot of people can relate to what it's like to have uh, parents who seem to get in your way and friends who have your back. There was young mischief and wonder and all these things. And the thing it actually reminded me the most of was one of my favorite movies of all time, Son of Rambo, which is set in England in the 1980s with a really young Will Poulter. It's really underrated. You should check it out. But anyways, this reminded me that telling an effective story across cultural lines is not so much about having to explain everything. You don't need dozens of little subtitles or cue card generations just setting up everything like, hey, in this village people are like this and they do stuff this way. Like, oftentimes those cultural apologetics just highlight what's different between places. When what expert level storytellers really do is highlight what's similar across different settings. You know, kids in school, kids playing, that sort of stuff looks similar in a variety of contexts all around the world. Anyway, if you're gonna be telling stories and you're wanting to bridge cultural gaps, here's what I recommend. Find an epiphany, make some connectors, and use shorthand. Let me explain what I mean by all that. 
Now this Creative Changemaker series is all about storytelling for impact. I'm operating under the assumption that you are aiming to tell stories with a purpose, stories that inspire action, climate action, justice action, to get people in solidarity with others who are more marginalized. Maybe you tell stories for a particular organization or cause, and the whole point of the story you're telling is to get people to care or give, donate as a symbol of solidarity. 10 bucks can do a lot. In spite of that, this story that you're telling still needs to be more about your audience than yourself. Think about the epiphany you want that audience to have. You know, I remember watching some documentaries about child soldiers when I was in high school and coming to the realization that I wanted to do everything I could that was in my power to make that stuff stop happening around the world. That is a strong epiphany. Once you have that, you wanna make connections, meet your audience where they are, and pull them towards that epiphany. You know, I'm thinking back to those documentaries I watched about child soldiers, and one thing that the filmmakers did was they included footage of themselves bonding with the kids, playing with them, uh, kind of goofing around and having a more lighthearted time. And I think one tempting thing for critics of the film to do is to say, like, why, why are you throwing in something so uh, goofy when the subject matter is actually really grave and really serious? Why are you inserting yourselves into the narrative? And I get that, but I think when you have seen these kids be regular kids, to connect with them on that level of shared humanity, it makes it all the more bothersome when you see them conscripted as soldiers. You know, the story carries this motif of childhood disrupted. And that was a big part of why I really felt the urge to do something after watching that documentary. A strong connector is this rich, universal experience that transcends the cultural boundary. It takes your audience from their own world, their daily experiences, towards the epiphany you want them to have. I already gave some examples from Cello Show, but connectors can be themes like uh, childhood dreams and ambitions and innocence. Uh, your connectors can be a point, like love is real, but you wanna, if you go that route, you wanna keep it short, simple, and sweet. You want the connector to be effective as a thought a person can have quickly, not a whole complex idea that takes time to unpack. Now in an earlier episode, I talked about the key for making relatable characters is having them go through an emotional experience, have a relationship, or be faced with a difficult decision that people can relate to. Those are strong connectors. So we've talked about epiphany, we've talked about connectors. What's left? Shorthand. I like to use the term shorthand to describe little bursts of hints that make unfamiliar things seem more familiar. All right, let me unpack that a little bit. You could be watching a foreign film, one in a language you don't know at all, but you hear the music that is in the background and that kind of cues you in as to what's what's happening here, what's the mood. You know, your brain might feel like you're still playing catch up with the subtitles, but the music has helped signal to you in advance the emotional stakes of the scene, what outcomes you're rooting for. This is because music is, if not universal, it at least goes across cultural boundaries with a lot more ease than words or language. This is why people can make those YouTube videos like, hey, I turned School of Rock into a horror movie. Do not walk away from me when I'm talking to you. Now music isn't the only tool that can do this. You can use things like color, pacing, editing. I remember somebody pointed out to me how many horror films use this contrast between red and green, the most jarring color combo, to create tension during build-up moments. So to do this well, you don't just want to be fluent in the culture of the story you're telling, but you want to be fluent in the culture of your audience as well. One example from my personal work. Uh, we were recently telling stories where people joined a community group and that gave them this sense of acceptance and belonging and the feeling of support. And we wanted to have people be reminded of times they felt accepted and belonging and supported by those around them. We thought people might we thought there might be a fair amount of people who experience something like that in a book club or in a church group or on a sports team. And we thought, are there ways that we could drop hints of those things uh, based on what we were filming in Africa? So if you film people gathered around and sitting in a circle formation, it kind of creates the feeling of being in a book club. 
if you get people singing or speaking in one voice, you know, you kind of feel like you're part of something. You're part of um, a group chanting something, maybe an audience in a sports arena. If you pay attention to the way sports films are edited and then try and make cuts that are similar, you might tap into that association of sports with team, being part of a team and have that carry over to the story you're telling. I'm a huge fan of the series Money Heist and they kind of do this well. There's a bunch of times where the, the characters who are all in on the heist together sing Bella Chow and it adds a strong uh, effect on the film because A, it shows how they function as a team, but B, that, that song was originally like a, a protest song for workers' rights and the people, the characters in Money Heist uh, are real underdogs and it kind of sends that signal in a way that I think a European audience, it's a Spanish series initially, would be more familiar with. I think when you get really into it, these shorthand tricks can be a lot of fun, and your audience doesn't need to explicitly recognize them for them to have their effect. They don't need to be like, oh, that's edited like the Mighty Ducks, we're a team. It can still have its effect if it's a subconscious, more subtle thing. If you don't already listen to the podcast Song Exploder, I highly recommend that. Uh, the premise is Hirshikesh Hirway interviewing different musicians about songs they wrote, uh, how the building blocks of these songs came together. He often has them bring uh, like phone recordings and voice memos that have the scraps of the song or their thought process as it was coming together. And in this series, you see so many great examples of how shorthand can work how certain textures or patterns or snippets of sound can conjure up associations and memories. And when you have it all together meshed as a song, you're no longer thinking of them individually, but they still create that desired effect. And that's what we're going for when we're crafting a story. As always, I hope this was helpful. Telling stories across cultures is a gift. We don't need to think of cultural differences as an obstacle, but rather something that can make your work more multidimensional.